G'day guys, welcome back. Uh, we're gonna be talking about five French nerdy AF wine terms that you should know about. How AF as as get it as French as I don't think that I don't think that's gonna fly. But anyway, stay tuned. All right, guys. I am completely aware that sometimes when when you get into a room full of like nerdy wine snobs, that they start throwing around some really crazy different words. Uh, now, I don't even know if you watch the last couple of of, of little um, uh, videos that we've done. I've even thrown a ton around myself and a few people have actually sent in comments, so thank you so much, uh, asking for some sort of explanations to them. So I thought I'd do a quick little video on just five absolutely essential ones that you should really know about. So firstly, number one. Tewa. There has probably never been a more confusing term than tewa, and a lot of people don't really understand it, but it's actually a really simple concept. A grapevine obviously grows in, obviously grows in the ground, but it's also submitted to a range of different uh, aspects of, of rain, of, of sunlight, of, of, and of course when the wine is made, there is that, the, that locality, the human element of making wine, and all of those little things together really represent the flavor of that wine. So it's not just Cabernet, for example, but it's Cabernet from a place. And it's Cabernet from a particular vintage, a particular year. We only really have, with the exception of some Southeastern Asian countries, we really only have one harvest a year. There is, there is not one Cabernet for all places, but there is a Cabernet at a vintage, at a time, at a place, with a soil type, with a certain amount of rainfall and sunlight, made by a certain amount of people in a particular way, and that all represents that flavor. And when you would typically use this is, you know, if you're asking, hey, what's the terroir about this area? What's the terroir about this, this particular wine that would uh, possibly impact this particular flavor? And wine's not the only one. Uh, you know, really well-made tea, really well-made coffee, really well-made chocolate, uh, plus most things that we actually put in our mouths on a daily basis, if you eat a lot of organic food, all of this has terroir. It's a reason why tomatoes taste delicious in Italy. Great terroir for tomatoes. Number two is sommelier. It's, it shouldn't it shouldn't be intimidating. A sommelier's role, their job, they're a professional whose whose role is to teach about wine, to talk about wine, and ultimately actually elevate your dining experience. Typically in the industry, we will just shorten it to SOMs. So often you'll see that the word bandied around as a SOM. But they are the, the profession at the highest level. These guys are outrageously talented. They are the industry's storytellers. Very, very, very important people. That moves us on to number three. Number three, cepage. It's a really, a, a really interesting word that um, quite often you'll typically only find when you start getting into the, the, the higher end of, of wine education. Uh, the way that it will typically used in a sentence is, you know, what's the cepage on this particular wine? It really means blend, base, in, in a very basic sense. It means the blend of something. So quite often, it's not just a single varietal that you'll be drinking. There are, of course, plenty of single varietal wines, but when you're talking about a wine of an area, and a famous one, for example, would be Bordeaux, uh, Bordeaux will be a blend of a couple of different varieties and in different years and different vintages there will be varying amounts of different varieties. Uh, so to, to question what is the cepage means you know what's the breakdown of varieties. Champagne often is you know that that will often be um, uh, be asked. Uh, Langueroso or other blends, international blends, but blends of all kinds. Sometimes a, a blend out of Kunawara for example that uh, that you would want to know the cepage of if you want to sort of dig down into the nitty-gritty little details of a particular wine. But that's that's number three, sapage. Number four, dosage. Dosage will typically be utilized uh, as, as a word to describe the amount of sweetness that's been back added to a sparkling wine. See, sparkling wine is outrageously acidic. Um, in fact, tasting base wine, so that the non-sparkling kind, the pre-sparkling kind, uh, can be one of the most masochistic exercises that I've ever done. Uh, so typically, you'll want a little bit of a dosage. Of course, uh, there are famous uh, champagnes that are, are famously known to be zero dosage. That means no sweetener added. Um, typically, you will find zero dosage wines will either be aged on their lees or their autolytics for, for quite a amount of time. And this helps give a little bit of creaminess to just the, the stripping, tight, mineral, crunchy, zippy acid that those wines typically will have. More often than not though, they'll be adding uh, you know, varying degrees of, of sugar, but that doesn't mean that they're actually sweet wines. It just means that it takes the edge off a little bit, fleshes out the wine a little bit, makes it a bit more enjoyable. So dosage, that's, that's number four. Number five, elevage. Elevage 
sounds very much like to elevate. Uh, typically this would be used as a term of, of maturation. What's the elevage on this particular wine? A Barolo, for example, um, you know, Barolo will have an elevage of a certain amount of years to be classified Barolo or Burgundy as well. They have mandatory rules. In Australia, we really don't have a lot of these rules, but it is a point of interest to know typically to ask the producer, hey, what's the, what's the elevage on this? Um, like I said, this is a real nerdy thing. Uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, might not be the first question you might wanna be asking, but it is actually a, an important term to understand when other people throwing it around you and you're feeling a little bit intimidated. A bonus one, a bonus one. I've used it a couple of times. Uh, I thought I'd address it here just so everyone can get across it, lees. I personally don't think it actually sounds like a great word, but the alternative is yeast, which typically also doesn't sound like a great word for a lot of people when talking about something as delicious as wine, but yeast are the little microbes that actually make wine happen. They're, they're very, very important. and They contribute a lot of flavor. Yeast is of course used all over the world for varying purposes, but one of the most important purposes, of course, is bread making. And quite often we'll use terms like bready or brioche or nutty, uh, and this is to describe a, a type of flavor called autolysis or, or, or autolytics. When, when yeast uh, start to, to consume all the sugar, produce alcohol, and um, they start to die towards the end of fermentation, they'll actually consume their own cell walls, releasing this really, really delicious flavor. And over time, you'll get more of this flavor, leaving it on its lees, or what the French might call sur lee. Uh, and, and indeed will actually bottle wines. You'll see little terms on there go, Sir Lee. Uh, those wines will typically have a, a little bit more of those, those indicative flavors. And for things like champagne, they can be delicious. They can be utterly amazing. For certain styles of white wines, uh, then, you know, that are stirred up in the barrel, there's another magical word you should know called batonage, but that might push our limit beyond what uh, I think we'll talk about today. But anyway, thank you so much for joining. There is five nerdy AF wine terms that everyone should know, plus a little bonus one.